and welcome to Off the Fence, a very special edition of Off the Fence brought to you in association with Ball Sports, of course, across all the At The Races digital platforms. But this is your Grand National preview show. Grand National Aintree Special. We're going to be covering the big one, the Grand National first and foremost, and then we'll be looking at a few of the other grade ones across the three days of action up at Liverpool. It's an excellent meeting. We have declarations so far for the Thursday, but we are recording this two days out. So we do, we only have entries for Friday, Saturday, but we'll cover that when we get to it. And I get to do this all in the company, as always, of Barry Garrity and Tony Keenan. Tony, this is a meeting that I saw a tweet go out that said, you know, how wonderful. No uh, anti-post screenshot bet slips on Twitter. No preview shows. No hype for weeks in advance like Cheltenham. Aintree every year just creeps up on us. And then we get three days of marvellous racing to look forward to. Yes, and especially when there's been no racing at all, probably in Ireland in the last week. I think we've had one turf meeting since Easter Monday is the only thing. So definitely people are... Are, are chomping for this. Um, I do think the fields are after cutting up a little bit for tours, the more than I, I, I anticipated. I was looking at the races on Saturday and Sunday. There looked to be some massive fields, 20 plus runners, and um, this is in the graded races, and only one of the tours, the races, has thrown up um, eight runners or more. So that's a little bit disappointing. So hopefully they'll, they'll stand up a little bit more um, on Thursday and Friday. I think they will just looking at the horse that have jocked up. And it's not to say the horse that isn't interesting, but I just was expecting um, a little bit uh, bigger fields. It does sound that like Willie Munns is not running any of his real superstars. And Gordon Elliott sounds a little bit iffy on some of his, um, maybe Irish point and tupe, but we'll see. We shall see indeed. And of course, this unsettled weather, as you've touched upon there, Tony, does have a factor with these field sizes that we've seen on Thursday so far, Barry. But forecasts suggest that it will dry up for Saturday at least. So I think we should have some fair jump racing ground, shouldn't we? Yeah, I'd like to think so. There is a good bit of rain forecast for Wednesday, tomorrow. Um, but it's given dry after that and, and temperatures are up to 17 and 15 degrees so it does dry well entry um, and especially now you're getting longer days and when you get those temperatures so I wouldn't be surprised to see a good improvement um, in the ground it could be ideal uh, good to soft softish ground I wouldn't be surprised no excuse territory if that's what we could have for Saturday and that'd be perfect um, obviously first year that we're going to see some more changes Barry to the race including uh, the start of the race and of course the smaller field size which is one of the changes that has sort of garnered the most um, split opinion I think it's fair to say uh, what, are you, what are your views on the national changes if any do you think they're going to have a, a, an effect this year? Um, I think it's a good call um, the modification to the fences created more speed because the fences weren't the test that they were before horses were going faster earlier the canal turn became a problem because you had so many horses competitive at that point there was a lot of congestion so I think they've done the right thing by reducing the field size and um, also bringing the first fence closer to the start as well but bringing it closer you just horses mightn't get to that high level of speed that they would get if there was more time so I think the decisions were right um, and hopefully the race should go well you, you'd hope Tony, do you um, do you tackle the national from a betting point of view any differently to any other races? Is it a race that you like to have a bet in? Obviously, that's what a lot of people will be tuning in for this show. But when you step back and look at the Grand National as a whole, is it, is it a race that you yeah want to get involved in? And how do you play it? Well, I am a punter, so I'm definitely having a bet in the Grand National now. I, I think you'd have to hand in your, your, your member's card of the Punters Union if you weren't having a bet in the Grand National. But in, in terms of um, seriously, uh, not really, no. I know. Look, I'd, I think I'd, I'd like to have uh, maybe this time of the year a flat maiden when I thought there was only three or four with a chance. Um, the only thing, I suppose, from an Irish point of view... Um, I, I obviously prefer when the more Irish horses are in these races, the better, just for the simple reason that, that I know a bit more about them. And this year, obviously, it, it is a hugely Irish race. Um, what are we look, looking at at the moment? I think, depending on what um, Gordon Elliott and the O'Leary's do with Conflated, we're looking at 28, 29 of the 30, no. Um, I think it's going to be seven or eight um, non-Irish runners at the moment. So just to say to see what it is, so kind of over seventy percent of the field, which is I think the highest ever. Like the number has been heading up in the last ten renewals. Um, I think it was what twenty six or twenty eight out of the forty last year, but this season now is just um, 
is really extreme um, in terms of the Irish challenge. And look, I do think there's plenty of Irish horses in that probably don't hold much of a chance or don't hold much of an obvious chance on form that are maybe keeping some better handicap ones at the bottom of it out. But um, yeah, that's I suppose that's the economies of scale that some of these big yards and big owners have um, available to them. Okay, before we get stuck into this year's race, guys, I want your worst, like, hard luck stories from the Grand National. Barry, you can go first, <laughs> obviously riding in it over many years. What was your, like, the hardest luck story you had in the Grand National? The worst luck you had in it? The worst luck? Oh, it was in my youth, uh, falling off Alexander Banquet at Beaches Brook the first time, falling out the back door. I felt pretty small that day, so, um, yeah... There's obviously more bad luck going on entry than good luck because it's it's yeah, it's 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 hard enough to win, it's hard enough to be placed and it's it's an achievement to get around. So I suppose yeah, that was that was one that yeah, it was a bit I was a bit red in the face after that one. You walk back with your head hanging a little lower than normal. Um, what about you, Tony? Have you had any real bad luck betting stories in the national? No. Any uh, real, real near misses? No, no. I don't think I've had a horror story. At all. I, I backed Fanny in, in it last year. I thought maybe he was a little bit unlucky, but some of it was, was his own... Um, you know, losing half a length at every fence on the second circuit. But no, I, I don't think I've had a, a, had a horror story in this race. So I don't stake it strong enough for there to be a real... Um, Horror story. I haven't backed any brilliant winners of it either, but um, yeah, it's look, it is what it is. A bit of fun indeed, and let's try and find a winner then. Let's get stuck into this year's renewal. Corrick Rambler currently with Balls Force is your five to one market leader. Uh, won the race obviously last year. You guys all know that by now, and of course you will also know about his excellent run in the Gold Cup when we last saw him. I am Maximus seven to one. Meeting at the Wards in the same colours. 8-1, to one. Uh, Vanillier in there, the horse Tony's just mentioned, 9-1, to one. Kitty's Light, what a story that would be, 12s, Mr. Incredible, 12s, Limerick Lace, she's so likeable at 14s, I'm not going to go through the whole field, but every time I keep rolling the page down, you get to another one that deserves a mention, like a Marla Mission, uh, very much looking forward to seeing him in this race, could be right up his street, but... Uh, let's try and narrow it down. Tony, I will come to you first. You've already referenced there that there's a lot of Irish form in here and there's a lot of Irish form near the top of the market specifically. Um, I suppose to start with, are you, is there any horse that maybe I've mentioned there that's a you know relatively fancy price that you really don't think has a chance? You're happy to write off the list altogether? Um, of the fancied ones, well, I think with both um, Mr. Incredible and I Am Maximus, you're probably going to know quite early in the piece where you stand. Um, Mr. Incredible can be can be a tricky customer, and I Am Maximus has his own way of jumping. Now, it has proven quite effective um, this season. He was better than ever in the Bobby Joe the last day. It's just, does he get too far back over the first three or four fences? Um, it would, would be a concern. I think Noble Yates is one that he, he's relatively short in the bet and just is he a little bit too high in the weights I think would be kind of a concern with him. You, you can see it with Corey Grammer. Corey Grammer was a, a hugely impressive winner of the race last year. There's very few horses kind of breeze to the lead as he did. And I know he didn't win it all that far but just the, the manner in which he got there um, couldn't put anyone off him. But no, there's no there's no one up at the front end of it that he absolutely hated. Um, but bar the possibility you would if you were betting and running i think you would know quite early but with the the mr incredible and uh, i am maximus okay and the same question to you barry is there anyone that like we've said short enough price that you're in your head thinking that doesn't have a chance yeah i suppose for nearly yeah, there's a little bit of trust uh needed with him he was beaten 40 lengths by our maximus and um, getting 12 pounds so there is a lot of improvement there to come. Um, now, he's, he is nicely weighted. He's only up £4 from when he was second last year. But as Tony mentioned, his jumping was, wasn't was just as sharp as you would like around there last year. So he could find himself out, out of it. So on the book, he's probably, to me, he'd look like bad value. And say so you're taking on trust, he's going to come back in the form he was in last year. But on his run into Bobby Joe, he's, he's a lot of improvement in that. Okay, yeah, we want facts and form here, don't we? That's what we want to go on. Uh, right, so then, Tony, let's narrow the list down. Who has made your Grand National shortlist at this stage? 
I think of the front end, I prefer meeting of the Walters. Um, I haven't backed them yet, which is probably a bit silly, but I think with the jockey workings coming out today, I'd say there's a chance he's going to drift back out. He would seem possibly towards string with um, Mark Walsh going with Limerick Lace and Paul Town and I am Maximus. I'm hoping he's going to drift back out. Um, I was really impressed with the Paddy Power Chase. I think that form is solid. Um, Panda Boy, Real Steel, two horse that have run so well in the race. The previous year, I think, was the winner on the tour. I think that form has a lot of solidity to it. Um, went to the Ultima, travelled very well for a long way, then seemed to blow up a little bit. Like it was effectively his first run since December 2017. He was in seat, it kind of brought down at the first of the Dublin race and festival. So, one that was the run needed a bit. The way he stayed on was, was very good. Um, his jumping for a novice has been very good so far as well. So, I'm happy enough to take, take a chance on him at the front end of the market. And the main one of bigger prices there that I was given a chance then, and this is a little bit weather related and would, would want to dry out too much as Delta work. Um, he was a good toward in a two years back and I thought he made his move a little bit sooner than ideal that day. He made, made up his ground quite quickly. And then he was going fine last year when he unseated at the 21st. Um, was a, a multiple grade one winning chaser back in the past there and was rated as high as 171. I think he's down to 157 now. Form this season hasn't been brilliant, it hasn't been terrible either. He was off a break in the bind hurdle, showed a little bit staying on. Um, actually reading the trainer and, uh, and the owners, they seem to be very positive about him at the moment. So I think he's around 25 to 1, something like that. Um, he'd be the one at the h -way price. There's one or two other outsides, we may come back to those at the end though. Okay, we'll save that for the end. We'll bounce over to Barry. Um, are you in agreement with anything that Tony has said there in regards to his sort of main selection of the fantasy runners with Meeting of the Waters? Yeah, no, definitely. I'm with Tony on Meeting of the Waters um, for the same reason, Joe. He's very good at, at Christmas in Leopardstown. He got a good penalty for that, but obviously this, his first run back more or less in the Ultima and he looked like a horse was going to improve for the run. So I would like him. He is only a seven-year-old. Um, so he's not exposed, but he's he's to me he's a horse who's well in in the handicap. If this was a, a regular chase, he's the one you'd want to be on. Um, of the others, I have Manor Mission, who is second in the old Hennessy, hasn't run since. There was a good run second. That's all right, Gino. Um, he's been kept for this race. They had, you know, they had the they put out the idea of possibly going for the Gold Cup, but then they they changed their mind on that and they've trained him for this. Now he has enough weight in comparison to Carrick Rambler. So you could argue he's not that well handicapped, but that was a good run in a handicap. Um, and he's going to love the trip and he does jump really well. So I would like him too. Okay, Marla Mission as well then. And Tony, you've mentioned that, you know, horses at an each way price, they're, they're not likely to win it. Not a win selection, but something that you can envisage running into some places. And of course, I'm sure there'll be plenty of extra places available with ball sports as well. So who would you see running, you know, well without winning? Yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm coming to ones that are kind of more front to mid of the market. for. I think both Malin Mission and Panda Boy are, are solid each way or place only bets. Both of them in general jump well stay well, have a decent preparation. The one concern I think with both of them is that I just wonder did they lack a bit of pace in the finish. I think that's been the way with, with, with both of them. There's one there, uh, he's actually drifted to kind of a mad price on the machines there. He's out as big as 50s for a horse that has a really good season. That's Capadano. Um, I know he's much shorter with the bookies, but just his exchange price seems to be a little bit, a little bit big. He, he ran the race last year and was kind of pulled up coming to two out and, and you might look at that and think oh god has he has he not stayed there he had a very very wide trip in the race last season he, he traveled a hell of a lot further than anything else and he, he made a number of mistakes and that would be an issue with him his jumping again but his season this season has just gone so much smoother than last year he had the one run in the red mills chase then on to a three like it was understandable that he, he wasn't at absolute peak things this season much better um Good run in the Savills at Christmas, then he went over for the Cotswold, won it. Probably not the strongest piece of form, but won it well. Then an excellent run, kind of in a steady run right in there that, that wouldn't really suit. I just I wouldn't take last season's run as conclusive evidence that he doesn't stay. And the kind of price that he is, I, I think I'll have to have something on him. But I think it would be win only because it would be lurking in the back of my mind that his jumping is a little bit of, of a worry. But yeah, price seems a little bit big for a horse with a bit of class and a bit of upside. And that um, this will be his first run in the handicap. Maybe might be worth taking a small chance on him. Okay, Capadano thrown into the mix as well. Um, final word to you, Barry, just in regards to our favourite, Corrick Rambler, because, of course, a lot of punters out there watching this or fans will see, you know, know everything that he's done from last season to this season. 
Uh, and he's five to one. Yeah, he's a pretty fair price, really, given that we know how much he loves this sort of test. My only concern is the classic, how much of a hard race did he have in the Gold Cup? Would you be in any way worried about that with a horse like him who, I don't know, seemingly keeps a little back, bit back for himself anyway? Um, you could be slightly concerned. Um, there's often a three-week gap between Cheltenham and Aintree, but this year, this week, or this year there's four. Um, that makes a big difference. So you don't have to get them back into work as early. You get that little bit longer to recover. Um, so I think, no, I... I'd be yeah, I'd have good respect for him and the potential for drying ground is coming in his favour Tony mentioned when he spoke about him early on how he got to the front he breezed to the front and he got there so easy and he didn't win too far but that's his style of racing and Derek Fox has the latest challenge on him if you remember him winning the ultimate boat years he waited as long as he could delivered them late he showed good pace but he only does as much as he needs so when he gets to the front you'll see him pricking the ear he would be looking up in the stands so he it was a good performance last year he's obviously up a good bit in the weight for that but he's running the gold cup. He's a worthy favourite. Definitely a worthy favourite. Okay. Worthy and correct favourite. Um, hopefully the ground will dry up a fraction for him as well. Uh, if you are a favourite bracket in the Grand National. I think that about wraps up our Grand National chat. We've thrown plenty of names into the mix for you. Some at bigger prices and then some more obvious ones as well. Let's roll on to the rest of Aintree. And I should again reiterate the fact that we are recording this on the Tuesday night. So we only have declarations for the Thursday. So we'll go through the grade ones for the Thursday and then the Friday, Saturday, we'll just kind of rattle through at a bit more speed because obviously we don't want to waste your time talking about horses that aren't even going to show up. So onwards we go. Uh, Tony, let's start with the Manifesto Novices Chase. One of the races that, like you said, a little bit surprising, a small field, just the five runners. But we do get the rematch between Grey Dawning and Ginny's Destiny. Grey Dawning is your even money favourite. Ginny's Destiny is 100 to 30 as I speak right now. Is there any way Ginny's Destiny can turn the tables with Grey Dawning? Uh, there is a great darling maybe revert to some of his uh, maybe more shoddy jumping from earlier on in the season but I would have it between them I, I think that Tornos was an excellent race at Cheltenham um, I know the Ryanair and it are run over four long separate uh, distances but if you're doing the kind of time comparisons if you put the same part of the course alongside each other the, uh, the novices will come out way better than Ryanair which is, is a fair reflection on them um, two very likeable horses I'm kind of a bit annoyed uh, that the two have actually pitched up in the one race I think if they hadn't gone for separate races I, I wouldn't have had a decision to make and I don't know if I'm going to bother trying to have a decision, but I'll be expecting them to, to fight it out again. Yeah, I, I that's the way I'm I'm thinking that Grey Dawning will get the better of him again, Barry. I The more I watch the replay of Cheltenham back, the more respect I have for Grey Dawning, I think. I think I slightly didn't do him justice in the aftermath, but actually um, it was a proper performance that. Oh, yeah, definitely good performance, a good race. But that was 2-4 around Cheltenham. Um, two four round entry is a different story, um, and both of these horses probably would have gone for the brown advisory had fact of file not been there, um. So you could argue their ideal trip is three mile, um, and I just wouldn't have been able to let Tom coming from two miles stepping up and trip. It'll be just interesting to see what rain falls and how soft it is because the bigger the test, the more it's going to suit those. But um. If it doesn't get really soft on the first day, I think L.A. de Tomp could be a little bit of value just with that pace angle. Paul would be able to stalk those two and come at one late rattle. So I think there could be a little bit outside those two. OK, looking away from the top two. Interesting. Uh, Barry, I will stick with you for the grade one juvenile hurdle that follows. Uh, obviously, Sir Gino, 8 to 11, very short price favourite. Everyone knows the story by now. We didn't see him at Cheltenham due to the stable form. He was the anti-face favourite for the triumph hurdle. And we do get a bit of triumph form in here because next best in the market is Cargis at 7 to 2, who was second in the triumph hurdle behind her stable mate in Marshborough. And then it's Khalif de Burley at nine, uh, uh, nine to two as well. Yeah, uh, seven to two, Cargis actually, sorry, nine to two, Khalif de Burley uh, for the Paul Nichols Yard. Another horse that missed at Cheltenham, planned miss of Cheltenham for that horse coming here instead. Then it's Nurburg Ring at eight to one. Um, so much excitement around Sir Gino, so much disappointment when we didn't get to see him at Cheltenham, Barry. But like, how, how do we know that the, the stable is going to be all right and the horse is going to run to form? Well, they're one from four in the last two weeks and that was in the last week. So, um, yeah, you're, you're taking it on trust. Um, 
but yeah, the vibes have been good that they're that they're coming back to themselves. Um, a lot of these horses have been in work, obviously. So yeah, that that's the feel I've got. Um, so Gino, look at he was the horse we were all singing about going to Cheltenham, um, and obviously didn't get there. So he goes here fresh, which has to be a big plus over Cargis. You speak about Carrick Rambler earlier, the turnaround between Cheltenham and Aintree. It's possibly easier for an older horse than it is for a younger horse. So a four-year-old just mightn't bounce out of Cheltenham the same way. Cargis has travelled over from Ireland now for the second time in a month. So you'd have to wonder about that. Um, Paul Nichols' horse, Khalif de Burley, who beat uh, Gimme Five in Kempton in the Adonis. Gimme Five then disappointed um, in Farius at Easter. So we'll throw a slight question mark over that. He was a good winner, but the two of them pulled clear of the third. The form looked really good. Maybe Harry Derm's horse at Farius just didn't turn up. Um, but Khalif de Burnett, I suppose he has to go and do it. Uh, but you could say the same for Sergino for what he's done too. But he was very impressive in Cheltenham. Personally, I'd be taking a punt on uh, Sergino. Hopefully those horses are back to form. Maybe Tony will think differently. But uh, yeah, I think I think the vibes are reasonably good on them. Reasonably good. Oh, I'm, I'm going to need more than that, Tony. And I think punters will agree. Like, it's such a chance you're taking at such a small, at, at such a short price as well. Like, how do you weigh that up? Yeah, I think the market just makes up your mind for here quite easily. Um, I'd be open minded as well as to whether Sergino will just prove a superior horse to Cargis. I think that's very possibly look really good in January. But you've this you just lack of information or lack of evidence at least on the on the stable form and she has advanced Kyrgyz advanced the form to me in the triumph hurdle. I would have her much closer to him in the market. Like going into the race, I was thinking Nurburgring might have a little chance. Um, probably shipped a wee bit better than the form in the triumph. But there's, there's again he's too short of a price relative to Kyrgyz. See Kyrgyz more than two to one um, nine to four shot of back there there today. Um, I thought in the triumph, uh, she over raced, uh, that, that was kind of the problem. Uh, I think if Danny Mullins the ride back again, he, he tried to hold on to her for a little bit longer. Um, she has no problem with testing ground. In fact, that might well suit her very well. She's a big kind of scopey mare. Um, this, I, I take all the points Barry's saying there that like, you just don't know what these Cheltenham horses like. I think at Fairy House, um, I think the Cheltenham horses were kind of one from 21. Jade de Grugy was the only horse that, that won. And, uh, even with the week later, Cheltenham was running more tests and ground. That would often be the case. That's another factor to bear in mind. But again, I just think at the market, uh, seven to two Kyrgyz is, is definitely the bet here. Yeah. Okay, confident then. Well, not confident, but confident that's the right price anyway, or a nice price. Um, Tony, let's stick with you and roll on to the bowl. Um, this is intriguing because we've got Jerry Kalam. Top of the market, 11 to 8, second to Gallop and Deschamps in the Gold Cup, of course. Shishkin, we know, same rules apply to Sergino, didn't show up at Cheltenham because of the stable form, comes here instead, 3 to 1. Then Corbett's cross in against his elders at 7 to 2. How How is he going to stack up in here? This is a whole other level of a test, isn't it, for him, Tony? Yeah, I think he'd be my way into the race and I'd be looking to take him on. Uh, Barry mentioned this on the Cheltenham Review Show, I'd agree completely. He was really impressive in the National Hunt chase, but he, he beat a horse with a problem. Um, Embassy Gardens, what, what was it, uh, arterial fibrillation or some sort of an issue afterwards, he still hadn't recovered from the following day. So I, I, I don't know what that form means. There's certainly not an awful lot of substance to it when you compare it to horses that are coming from. Um, gold Cups and King George's and, and races like that. Shishkin, you're kind of in the same boat with Sergino. Um, I, I think Jerry Clum's a very solid favourite here, very effective at the track last season. He's relatively fresh, having not run from Christmas until Cheltenham. And actually last season he, he, he thrived on racing uh, more than anything. He, I would say he arguably improved. Um, coming from the Brown Advisory back to, to win the three-mile race here. So I, I think around 11 to 8, 6 to 4, he, he's a very solid favourite. Okay, solid favourite then. Um, Barry, we have spoken plenty about Corbett's Cross. We, I know you're a fan of him. Um, but as Tony's outlined there, the form we can pick apart. And like you would have a lot more on this than I would. But like, how difficult is it at this stage in the season for a novice like him to step into this sort of company? Like This is very deep water for him. Yeah, it is, and it is, and it isn't. I suppose like he's going to step into open company in his first run next year. So, um, if he didn't line up an entry, he'd line up and down right maybe in his first run next season, and no one would think a, a thing about it. So, I wouldn't have a concern. Um, 
you know, he's a good level of experience. He was unlucky not to, he was unlucky to be brought down on his previous start. Has jumped well, has jumped and has improved, and he ha- he has had plenty of runs. So um I wouldn't be concerned about that, but I would I would agree with Tony um as regards to the, the strength of that form. He was an easy winner, but Embassy Gardens had an irregular heartbeat afterwards. He still had an irregular heartbeat the following morning. So, you know, he was a horse who well underperformed. Um, so there will be a question mark Jerry Colomb rock solid he was good there last season he was a good second in the Gold Cup and as Tony mentioned he, he went to the Gold Cup a fresh horse so he should bounce out at Cheltenham too so he's probably the one you would want to be on OK Barry I want to stick with you uh, for the entry hurdle please I mean the Thursday card is excellent with all these grade ones uh, but again we've got Bob Ollinger here a horse who you guys have had very different views on this season so I'm intrigued to hear the comments here Bob Ollinger is 11 to 8. It was outlined very early on this year, I suppose, that this was going to be his target, Aintree, over two and a half miles in the Aintree hurdle. So he is your market leader, taking on in Perry Pass, who, of course, chased home state man or led state man for a long way at Leperstown when we last saw him, 15 to 8. And then Langer Dang stepping up into hand, uh, from handicap company into grade one level, of course. Uh, but Barry, I will start with you and the conversation around Bob Ollinger. I know you're a fan of what he's done this season. Are you sticking with him here? No, <clears throat> um, no, I'm not. I'm Imperial Pass. <laughs> I'm. A, I've been. A, I have been a fan of Imperial Pass. I thought he was. He ran a brilliant race in the Hatton's Grace, and I don't think he had fully recovered from that. That was his first run of the season on very soft ground. He ran very keen. He was beaten a length by Tia Hoopoo, who obviously went on and done so well at Cheltenham. Um. But running so keen, I think he bottomed himself out, out that day. And then he went to Leopard Center Christmas. Paul Town had dictated the pace in front and statement. Uh, he was a little bit keen at times. He didn't jump as fluently. I didn't think he finished out his race at all. So I thought the Farius had left this mark on him there. And then they made the run on him at the Dublin Racing Festival, which completely backfired. Um, so you could draw a line definitely through that. I think you could, I won't say ignore his previous run, but I don't think he was at his best. I think he comes here fresh. Um, obviously a really good winner of last year's Ballymore. Um, so now I'd be very sweet on him. As regards Bob Allenter, he was good in the rail keel, um, but he didn't get a shout in against Stateman in the in the DRF. Um, you know, he ran a good race, but no, it would have had to me to threaten more to uh to win a race at this trip against the Harsak Imperial Pass. I'd rather see him open trip a three mile, although they don't think he gets the trip, but I think he'd be better suited by that. Okay. All right, well then, Tony, over to you because I'm quite, I've got it wrong with Barry now. And so now my confidence is wavering, but I think I'm pretty confident on the fact that you will not be tipping up Bob Ollinger here. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit ABB, anyone but Bob here. Um, I, I won't be, I definitely won't be back at back, back in him or, or having anything to do with him. I actually haven't come down on anything yet. I, I'm actually going to wait for the day and hope that the eight stand the ground in the morning and I'll have each way betting something, but it, it definitely won't be him. I just think you need to probably win it more or less coming there on the bridle without having to get into a battle. I, I know this is a lower quality race with without the likes of Statement or, or Constitution Hill, the kind of classic horse, really top horses coming from the, the champion hurdle division. But, um, you know, I think there has to be something in there uh, to beat him. And I think, uh, yeah, I just, I just want to wait. I just don't want to get caught having a bad value each way bet on, I don't know, um, Tuesday evening or Wednesday when, when something comes out. They got a few of them at Cheltenham. I'm just going to wait till the morning and see, can I get the eight still in it? Okay. Uh, that is Thursday that we had declarations for. Let's move on to Friday. Um, very much up in the air on what's going to show up here. So this will just be a rattle through. But if we have strong comments and views, then we will give them. Uh, so on the Friday, the first race of the, the grade one is the mild main novices chase over the three miles and one furlong. And the Kim Your winner, I know the way you're thinking, is two to one favourite here in the Antipose markets, taking on um, Gianti Classico, another festival winner, obviously, for Kim Bailey and a Roco in there as well. But Tony, I want to come to you first here because do you think we'll see Broadway Boy here? Yeah, I think by all accounts, he's running, he's jocked up here. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say he will run and he had excuses for Warwick with the ulcers. He will have a way to go now to match some of these um, JP McManus horses in this. They, they, they look very good. Um, I like the Rocos run in the Turners. But looking at the prices there currently, he's what, 130, whereas the horse that... 
bolted up, tucked the Kim Muir apart, and I'd say that was quite a good Kim Muir um, by standards of that race. It is two to one, so I think if the prices were as they currently stand, I would probably lean more. I know the way you're thinking. Just the way the back that horse, the way the horse was ridden, um, and then what he did kind of in the closing stages to pull away, I would say that he was a graded horse and a handicap. That can be the way with a lot of... Um, with some Irish horses that win festival handicap, they do turn out to be to be great one performers. There's a fair record of those over the years, and yeah, he'd kind of be hard to oppose at the top of the market here. I think he's pretty solid, and they've a hell of a back up there in the Rocco too. Yeah, absolutely strong team, strong novice chase team. Full stop, really, for the uh, team at Manus. But Barry, in in this race, do you think? Like Tony, that I know the way you're thinking is the a the correct horse to be topping the market, but also pretty fair price given what he did at Cheltenham. Yeah, he was very impressive at Cheltenham, um, and he beat Gitmaker, who was second. Um, I think the pace of the race probably might have exaggerated his winning distance and the comfort of it. Um, you know, he he probably showed his limitations over hurdles. He wasn't a superstar, which to me, I would use as a gauge how high can he go over fences if he wasn't a superstar over hurdles or wasn't. A proper grade one performer. I just wonder. Um, I wonder about the strength of the Camero myself. Albeit it was a good performance. Um, Roko definitely caught the eye. He ran a good race at Cheltenham. He had good form. Like that, he won a he won a, a Martin Pipe before. But Broadway Boy is only a six year old. He had a very busy season to that point in Warwick. Um, he protected the rat behind him when he won the 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 good staying handicap at Cheltenham on New Year's Day. So he has a good level of form. He comes here fresh after 90 days. So to me, he could be an, an each-way play here um, and maybe take on the favourite. Okay. I, I, hope, I hope Broadway Boy gets his big day in the sun because he's such a likeable horse, uh, but he does need to bounce back. Let's bypass the top novices hurdle, not because we're not giving it the respect it deserves, but we just don't know what's going to run. Obviously, Mystical Power currently in there and Slade Steel uh, for the rematch. They're co-favourites right now with Ball Sports, but either or of them could step up in trip. You've got Dysart Enos, who will show up. But after that, the likes of Caldwell Prota, we're expecting to see him on the Saturday, not the Friday. So uh, we will bypass that and we will head straight to the Melling Chase, guys. Uh, two and a half miles here. And the market is currently, uh, has John Bon up at the top of the market, but of course expecting to see him over the two miles. But after that, you've got Pick Dory, last year's winner at three to one, Protector at three to one if he shows up, Envoy Allen six to one, Bambridge, need the hair dries out for him, bless him. Uh, but Tony, Pick Dory versus a Protector at in here, uh, obviously very different profiles coming into this. And of course we had the added sort of, uh, theme I guess of the British Trainers Championship here Paul Nichols, Dan Skelton going head to head so these sort of races are going to have added pressure yeah, they are, but I suppose the, the big race on Saturday is going to be, could tell all what Willie Mullins challenge for that as well he's a few fancy runners and that John Bond, it's just like to see him run now after that that jump and performance that he put in in Cheltenham in January um, that will be lurking in the back of my head Okay, do you concur with those thoughts, Barry? Can you see that angle? Are you with it? I know I can see what Tony's coming with, yeah, but personally, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a John Brown fan. Um, you know, he was disappointing when beaten at Cheltenham on Trials Day and possibly should have won. Um, I'd say if James Bowen was doing it again, he would have just delayed it a little bit longer rather than getting into a scrap early. Um, and he might have won the won the race on the day. It wouldn't have been a brilliant performance. His jumping did let him down, but he's had a good bit of time to get his house in order. Um, obviously, Nicky's horses for a question mark with their form, if you like, but you'll have seen them on Thursday and you'll know where you stand. I think if they're in form, for me, John Bond would be the one um, stepping up and trip. He was only beaten once before that over fences when second to El Fabiola on the Arca. So he's got some very good form. Um, and like that, I mentioned earlier, as regards the novice chase, the two and a half mile horses, when you have a two miner stepping up to him around the entry, a two miner always holds the edge, just has that little bit of pace, travels more comfortably and can just deliver that late kick. Um, so to me, I'd always be keen to take on a stair with a two miner around the entry. Okay, that's interesting. And if the ground has dried up from enough by then as well, then that will surely help his cause a little bit. Definitely, yeah, it's, it's all a help. It, it creates more of a speed, emphasis on speed then. Yeah, yeah, that will be interesting. I, I didn't know if he was going to run, but 
you've made a solid case for him, Barry. Uh, let's move on to Saturday. As I said, slightly bypassing those novice hurdle races. Um, obviously, on Saturday, you've got the, the Mersey novices hurdle uh, over the two and a half miles earlier on in the cards. And we expect to see maybe Bryce days ahead. Caldwell Potter will definitely go there. Actually, I did speak to Paul Nichols uh, and he's going to run there, obviously having that first run for Paul. But after that, it's kind of hard to know what will show up. So we will bypass that and head to the Liverpool hurdle, Tony. Um, again, Tiupu tops the market here and uh, I feel like it might be unlikely that he shows up, but the horse that we probably will know will be there will be the likes of Saad Burley, four to one, obviously being here, got the T-shirt, before Crambo's in there as well. I expect to see him. He's jocked up as well as strong leader. Uh, so there's a few horses in there that are more than likely to run. But do you think we'll see the likes of Tupu and Flooring Porter? Um, I think you see Flooring Porter. He he is a record coming on for this race. Um, Punchestown isn't really an option for him going left handed. Um, Tupu, uh, Rob Corf got a uh, strong hand here with three entries, uh, Irish Point and Hidden Valley Lake. I wonder maybe with Hidden Valley Lake torn up, they were talking about after he won the bind, and he won the bind really impressively, um, that he might like to be fresh and maybe entry would set up for him. So may maybe he will be the runner here. Gordon Elliott sounds a little bit um, just unsure about running Irish Point. I wonder will they keep him for Punchestown and, and the same with um, Tupu. Both of those ran, obviously, one of them won at Cheltenham, one of them was a very good second. So maybe they, they want something to take on Willie Mullins. Gordon Elliott is running a lot of his better horses here, but just to have some good representation of Punchestown, maybe Hidden Valley Lake could be the one. As you mentioned, there's like excited about earlier, actually ran very well in the stairs, hoard, and it's just whether at 12 years of age he's, he's just got the, the speed for some of these. But the, this race is a kind of a, a very stiff test, like you're pushing for three mile and one four long here, further than the stairs at Cheltenham, it can be a real slog. So he's not without a chance either. No, um, yeah, I, I just, I feel, felt, feel like their comments beforehand with Sada Burley before Cheltenham were kind of like, he was only just coming to sort of pitch perfect point. Whereas now a few weeks on, uh, I hope, I think that he might be firing on all cylinders as much as a 12 year old can. Uh, Barry, who would you like to throw into the mix there? Yeah, well, you'd have to respect Sarah de Burley and what he did last year, but as Tony mentioned, he's a 12-year-old, so he's definitely not getting any faster. Um, But he's a horse who does come to himself in the spring, so maybe there's potential for improvement Um, on his run in Cheltenham when he looked, you know, dead dead in the water, if you like, and then he bombed home, so it was a great performance. Um, but for me, Florian Porter, he loves it going left-handed. Uh, he ran a good race at Cheltenham, and obviously you're taking the winner out of that. You're presuming Tia Hooper doesn't go here. Um, so for me, he'd set the standard. Okay, sets the standard. There's also uh, the two mile novices chase on the Saturday. Uh, found the 50 currently tops that market. I think Gordon, um, I hope I hope he'll show up. And then after that, uh, Etalon is in there for the skeleton team at 100 to 30. And again, just lots of unknowns in here. Tony, do you want to throw anyone in at this very early stage? No, I believe that found 50 is running. Um, Willie Mullins hasn't uh, got anything entered that, 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 that looks a massive theory. Letty Thomas declared for Taurus this race. I know Hercule Desai racked up a big sequence last season. Um, maybe he would come back for it. He, he'd probably one that would prefer a bit of nice ground, though. Yeah, and um, Barry, last word to you on that race. Yeah, just if it does keep drying, um, and it was to get, the better it gets, I think the better for Nickelback. Uh, loves a flat track. Lots of pace. Um, I think he would be the most natural two-miler, but he would prefer better ground. So the better the ground, the better his chance. He might have an each-way squeak for someone. Okay, yeah, and had a nice break since that sand down win, of course. Um, and a healthy sort of double-figure price currently. So that is just a very early look at some of those grade one races. But, of course, the main focus in this show was indeed the Grand National. Hopefully, we have pulled out a winner and a decent amount of horses to give you a run for your money anyway and into the places with a bit of luck um obviously this was one of our brucey bonus shows listeners and viewers out there uh, we have a couple more coming your way before the end of the season including of course for punches town uh in a couple of weeks time so there is still some off the fence content coming your way for this jump season but for now this was a bonus episode for you, your Grand National Special, brought to you in association with Ball Sports. Enjoy the big one. Have fun with it. Do it responsibly. That was Off the Fence. <laughs>